Well, I think if anything there's anything like that. that we've inherited as, as the, I guess, a second generation after Prabhupada, it's that that burning desire, I guess, even at a small level, like at least like like me, uh, but this desire nonetheless to um, to spread Krishna consciousness in in a rational, intelligent, you know, non sectarian, non fanatical, non dogmatic, but pure, beautiful way. It's time to get inspired. Join us as we celebrate devotee success stories, preaching, business, community development, leadership and personal growth, all from the point of view of Krishna consciousness. Our goal? To help you to make your life successful. Hare Krishna, this episode is coming to you from the jungles of New South Wales, otherwise known as New Govardhan at Mawalamba. It's the Sacred Sounds Festival happening here. And um, a few weeks ago I did an interview with a, a good friend of mine, God brother Chandrasekhar Acharya Prabhu. And I thought it would be interesting um, for everyone to hear from him because he is a person that takes a bit of initiative and... Uh, tries to do things to help spread Krishna consciousness. He's um, done, he's a good musician, he's made some really nice modern music um, with the Mahamantra, and he's also made some pretty cool videos that he has on YouTube and Facebook. So I think it would be really inspiring for everyone to hear about it. And we can also hear about his efforts to preach in France to the local people and the challenges that that, that um, involved. So I think you'll find a lot of interesting lessons from the interview and uh, hopefully you'll get a bit of, bit of inspiration to try something similar. Until next time, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, it's my great pleasure to be back with another episode of Successful Vaishnavas with the world famous Chandra Sekhar Acharya Prabhu. So Chandra Sekhar Prabhu is uh, my god brother, he's also a disciple of His Holiness Pakti Charu Swami and um, I've known him for many years, we're actually close friends, but it's been a while since we caught up so I thought that it would be great to um, catch up and also do an interview. Um, because Chandrasekhar Prabhu is someone who takes initiative, he's not afraid to put himself out there, and um, he's a preacher. And so I thought it would be really interesting to hear Prabhu's experiences and um, you know share them with other devotees in the world who might get a bit inspired and might get some ideas um, about what they can do for preaching and uh, taking advantage of their talents in Krishna's service. So, Chandra Prabhu, welcome to the show. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, to start off with, um, could you just give us a quick recap of how you got to know about Krishna consciousness, and then um, we'll go a little bit further into what you've been up to. Okay. I met devotees briefly when I was nine on Venice Beach in Los Angeles, and then I received a book of Prabhupada in the L.A. X airport about 10 years later on my way back from Los Angeles to New York, where I was going to college, upstate New York, um, a school up there called Cornell. And um, I took that book with me to France the following year to do a, like a student exchange program, you know, mm -hmm. because my, and my dad was living in France, my mom in America. And so I kind of ping pong a lot between the two places. And so I wanted to be in Paris and do a year abroad there, so I took that book with me, and um, and one afternoon I, I looked in the back of the book and saw all these addresses, ISKCON worldwide, including Paris, so I called the temple, and it so happened that Bhakti Charuswami, our, our spiritual master, was going to be in town like a week later, uh, giving a talk at the Indian Embassy's cultural center. So... 
so I called an old, I called uh, called a friend um, called I Kipman. I said, "Hey, do you want to go to this talk? Uh, there's some Swami coming." <laughs> I didn't, you know, I didn't know. <clears throat> I I grew up in a Catholic, a loose Catholic uh, household. So, although I had started, you know, being coming interested in in Eastern philosophies in high school, and had dabbled in, you know, a little bit into Buddhism, and had just read the autobiography of a yogi by, by Paramahamsa Yogananda, I really didn't have much of a, you know, of any clue of, of what's called, of, you know, to use, to use the word, <clears throat> excuse me, to use the word delicately and with a lot of caution, the word Hinduism, you know, I was not really aware of the different schools. Um, but needless to say, I called my friend, he said, yeah, let's go. So I went there and then Maharaj Bhaktisar Maharaj came on stage and and he started speaking second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, and and I was just blown away. You know, I felt like, I felt like, you know what I felt like, Krishnandu? No, tell me. <laughs> I I felt like, um, like if I was like a janitor, you know, like whose job was to just clean the floor in, for example, a CIA top secret office, you know, a governmental <laughs> building, and. My job was just to go in after hours and just clean the floor and mind my own business and go home. And just one day out of the blue, you know, the, the, the top secret office like happened to be open, a total <laughs> fluke, right? And then just out of curiosity, I just walk in and I see all these like top secret documents on the, on the desk. And then just as I'm looking at all this stuff, this highly classified information, you know, one of the in charges of the program comes in and, and says like, you know, what are you doing here? Like, you're not allowed to be here. And, and then he says, well, I'm sorry, but you know, now that you've seen these documents, like you're, I'm going to have to kill the, you or, <laughs> yeah. or you're part of the, you're part of the conspiracy now, or you're part of the, of the, you know, you're, you're an insider now. And mm. there's just, there's no turning back as you've, you've, you have this knowledge. So that's kind of how I felt after listening to this lecture and, and, and participating in the Kirtan. Uh, so I lost that's my cool. taste. I lost my interest in, in academic studies. And unlike now where we have a lot more, of, I, I would say, common sense in, in telling young men and young women to, uh, you know, to finish their studies, we teach them about yukta vairagya, about the principle of, you know, of embracing the material energy in God's service, right, as opposed to renouncing it, um, in many cases, artificially. I was advised to quit my, quit my education, and you know, and, and join the Bhakta program. So much to the much to the to the surprise, or read my, much to the horror of my parents. You know, I, <laughs> Cyril <laughs> dropped out of, of an Ivy League school to to become you know to become part of the of the cult, <laughs> the Hare Krishna <laughs> cult, in the middle of France somewhere in some old castle. You know, washing <laughs> pots and God knows what else. And, and then somehow got involved in book distribution, went back to the, I went to Los Angeles, was in the Brahmachari Ashram there for like five, six years, the LA airport where I, I distributed a lot, a lot of Prabhupada's books to, to a lot of people, <laughs> including people like Johnny Depp and Robert Plant and uh, uh, Mike Tyson and, and uh, Tone Loke, who was like this hip hop artist in the day. Um, um, Tone Loke, man, Tone Loke. Do you, do you remember Tone Loke? <laughs> Funky, cool Medina. It's <laughs> funny that you remember. Him. Yeah, so he he got a book. I guess he's going back to Golok. <laughs> <laughs> Tone Lok going back to Golok. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah, so that's about it. And then I, I got involved with it with Indrajumna Swami's Polish tour. But before that, I was traveling with Mar with Bhakti Chiro March for like four or five years as his secretary. And that opened up my eyes to, you know, the whole world of this gone, you know, because traveling, just sheer traveling, as you were Bhakti Chirvami's, you know, personal assistant as well, before me, actually, I mm -hmm. took over from you, basically. I remember for those who are listening, Krishnandu was so tired in that service, he'd be, he'd be falling <laughs> asleep all the time, because it's a demanding service, but I remember I was kind of surprised, like, seeing <laughs> Krishnandu falling asleep all the time. During a lecture or during job, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, yeah, and uh, Guru Maharaj wasn't wasn't too impressed. I have to say, like, <laughs> I would sit right at the front and fall asleep. And he's like, if you're gonna fall asleep, don't it have to sit right in the front? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, it reminds me, you know, there's those two two slokas 
the brahmacharis only need two slokas. There's the waking up mantra and the going to sleep mantra. Mm. Have you heard this? So the uh, going to sleep mantra is Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. And you know the waking up mantra? Yeah, Shadida Vidya Yeah. <laughs> so that was pretty much the way I lived my life, unfortunately. I was a little bit no, sleep deprived, I mean, the service I was so demanding. Yeah, you were totally sleep deprived. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so then, then and just, before you, to, just before you continue, um, yeah, I remember, like, you know, I've, I met you in Mayapur, I think, the first time when you know, we were together with Guru Maharaj. And then we spent some time in Los Angeles Airport. And I remember you and our godbrother, um, Charu Chandra, with yeah. the, like the, the two moons of LA that were out to, at the airport every day, just distributing so many books. And uh, I also gave it a go, but I was definitely not in the same league. You know, I was definitely more of a, not even a shooting star. I was just a little star, you know, compared to, you know, what you guys were doing. It was really inspiring for me to see you guys out there, you know, distributing books and, um, yeah, just going for it. So, yeah, that was just some of my first uh, experiences with you, that you were so serious about book distribution and doing so well. So anyway, that was, you know, one of my first times when I got to meet you, and since then you've moved on to other things. So, yeah, anyway, continue. So you were the uh, servant of Guru Maharaj, and uh, how was that? And then the bass player, it was great. Then the bass player, yeah, it was, it was intense, it was purifying, it was eye-opening, it was humbling. Um, then the bass player of a village of peace, where you your famous your own and famous Sri Prahlad was the lead singer, uh, contacted me and said, "Hey, they needed they needed a replacement. They needed a new singer uh, because Sri Prahlad was no longer playing as the singer of Village of Peace." And so they asked me if I wanted to be a you know the singer for Village of Peace. And I'd always I'd grown up as a brahmachari, really, um, as a big fan of Raghunath, you know, Raghunath, mm. that was the big yoga teacher. He used to be the, the lead singer of, of the band Shelter. That, yeah, uh, yeah. And cool. Radhanath Swami actually claimed was the, was the most powerful preaching project in this gone North America in the, in the nineties, you know? Yeah. And they were, they were doing great. So the Krishna core, right? Krishna core. Yeah. Shelter. So then I was in Poland for for several years, like six years, doing the the rock concerts there and being exposed to the whole, you know, former Soviet Union ISKCON flavor, um, <laughs> which is definitely something else than, <laughs> than Southern California or, or even Australia yeah. or New Zealand. Yeah, totally. If anything, in terms of sheer numbers, you know, I've mm. never seen like so many devotees, like Kirtans with so many people. Then, uh, then all along, I had the desire to go back to college and finish my education. So I went back to, uh, you know, with the with the inspiration of Rita Anandam Maharaj, who I had met like early, early on in my Krishna consciousness in L.A. because he lived there. I went back to the University of California. I got a degree in in religious studies, uh, and then I went on to 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 England, to Oxford, got a master's in, in theology, and you know, and I kind of, I guess, it kind of helped me perhaps like speak a little bit more broad-mindedly a little bit with a little bit more knowledge of other world religions or the history of of, of religion and stuff like that and i think it's yeah, mm. definitely I think just to relate cool. to re- relate to people on a different kind of a level as well yeah. i think yeah and so yeah so now i'm just kind of involved with this krishna west project which i find inspiring and I'm, um, right now, I'm, kind of, I'm touring, giving some lectures wherever I'm, you know, invited, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> as, as as here now, right in Zagreb in Croatia, and there's a devotee called Sundarananda, an old disciple, Sachinanda Marge, who runs this Bhakti Yoga Center right in the heart of, of of Zagreb with a with a restaurant and slash takeout, you know, like a delivery, prasadam program, um, with a with a, a large congregation. And um, you know, I really like the style. There's no, there's no. It's kind of like the loft program, or uh, you know, over there in, in in New Zealand, or or the Bhakti Center in Manhattan. Uh, these sort of centers where where you know, there's not much stress on, on stress on dress, <laughs> and rather there's a sort of a come as you are ethos regarding mm. not only the people who come but the preachers themselves. I, that's kind of like the, the context where I feel inspired because I think that's that's kind of a, uh, a formula that that seems to already show uh, success in terms of reaching out to a local local uh, population. You know. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. yeah, cool. So you're traveling at the moment, and um, you've also got some online projects, like you've got your YouTube channel, Easy Bhakti. Yeah. Tell us more about that, because that's uh, something quite initi- um, what do you go, innovative, I would say. Well, you have these How did New it Zealand. Start? You have these New Zealand ladies. I forget their names. Like they had a, at least they have a YouTube channel going on for a while. Remember right, two right. Hare Krishna those, those girls? Those two Krishnas. It's called Those Two Krishnas those or something, Those two right? Krishnas, yeah. <laughs> That's really cool. Actually, I wanted to do a collaboration with, with, with them, but when I wrote to, I forget her name, she had a broken wrist or something. She couldn't do it. Uh-huh. And I never followed up. Yeah, but, the, the, um, so there's uh, Lavanga Kaylee. She's the uh, white girl, you can say. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then Ishra Keshri is the, um, she's the, the African-American girl. or African-American. wherever, African-African or something, <laughs> black, you can say. <laughs> If you want to be totally unpolitically correct, you know. Um, you can say black, isn't it? Or is that is that? I guess so. I don't know. I don't know. You're but anyway, so careful now, right? Is the white one <laughs> and the brown one, and you know they're both real far devotees, and they've done pretty cool things on their channel. So yeah. So did you start your? You saw their channel, and that kind of inspired you to start your I channel, saw, or you'd I already that, started? Or? I think I had already started. I saw their channel afterwards. Um, what got me inspired? Yeah, I saw channels. There's this guy called uh, what's his name. I even forget his name, um, but he's got, he's like, you know, more than, uh, he's, I think, a million followers now, um, Koi Fresco, and um, nice guy, uh, Californian, um, yeah, initiated in the Advaita Vedanta, like, I think, uh, the, 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 uh, what's it called, um, Vivekananda, you know, mm-hmm. ashram kind of thing, and he speaks about all sorts of, sort of consciousness-related topics, uh, ranging, you know, anywhere from lucid dreaming to taking, you know, hallucinogenic drugs, which obviously we, you know, we don't condone. But, uh, so, you know, I saw his channel. I was like, wow, I really, you know, we should, we have very little presence uh, on YouTube. And there's all these like Christian, you know, evangelical Christian preachers who have these big YouTube channels. And, you know, where are we, you know? So I thought, okay, let me just do my little bit in trying to popularize uh, bhakti yoga again to a, to you know to an audience that's mainstream intelligent educated and and who just wants to to hear the, I guess the essence of of Bhagavad Gita um, in a in a in a culturally you know neutral user friendly kind of cultural language if that makes sense you know what I mean mm, mm, mm. yeah what I really like about your channel is that as you say you're um you know, speaking in a way that everyone can kind of relate to, that it's um, within the context of the culture that most people are living in, you know, at least in the West. And um, are you like how you relate it to everyday experiences or topical things, like, you know, when the World Cup came out, you know, you did a few videos related to that. Could you share um, a few things about what your thought process was, you know, when you were doing your World Cup soccer? Um, or when I know, did the Super Bowl videos. one recently. Well, yeah. I mean, just I'm a kind of addicted to you know occasionally watching professional sports. <laughs> I admit as long it. as I mean, as long as you're not gambling on it, that's the thing. You know, <laughs> I don't gamble. I remember I asked Bhakti Chara Marge like ten years ago. I said, you know, Marge, I I watched you know the the NBA highlights and and the actual NBA finals. As a matter of fact, I remember I was traveling with him in like two you know four summers ago or three four summers ago, and we were in Zurich, and it was like it was Game Seven of 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 the NBA finals between Cleveland, uh, no Miami, the Miami Heat, and uh, and and I forgot who, and it was Game Seven in San Antonio, and so I remember in the middle of the night, you know, I'm traveling with my guru, but in the middle of the night I woke up with an alarm clock to <laughs> to watch the to watch the deciding Game Seven, you know, and I asked him, I said, you know, I, I, mean, I watch these things, and I know I know it's not so good for my Krishna consciousness, and he said, "Don't worry, it, it, it'll go. You know, you'll you'll grow out of it." But you know, it's been ten years, so <laughs> you're wondering when you'll get out of it, right? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I, I I watch it with with relative moderation. It's not like I you know I watch yeah. it a lot again. I just want highlights and stuff. But um, what was my thought process? Well, it's sort of like a justification, <laughs> like or uh, 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 dovetailing. You know, Krishna does say, for example, in the Gita that I am the ability in man. So I guess one way to justify watching professional sports is you can, you know, you can be in, in awe at, at, the, at the amazing sportsmanship that you see. And then if you're Krishna conscious enough, you just remember that, hey, that's, that's actually, uh, that's an expression of God's uh, own 
you know, glory and beauty right there. But of course, it's an indirect step. You could you know, do much better just reading Srimad Bhagavatam or Bhagavad Gita, you know, instead of taking a detour of watching some professional sports game to remember the glories of God, hopefully, you know what I mean? And before your internet dropped, I was just making the point, though, that it's obviously, I mean, I, I think, and I think most devotees would agree, it's obviously much better to, you know, read the Srimad Bhagavatam or read the Bhagavad Gita or chant some, you know, some rounds or do some kirtan or pass out some, some books or do some preaching then then you know watching then going the indirect way of watching some sports match in order to hopefully be reminded of krishna when you watch a you know a goal <laughs> so uh but hey you know we we yeah. all are where we're at and yeah we're not all sannyasis or like devotees who can like spend all days all day long literally just doing only nothing but hearing and chanting about krishna so uh, you know yeah and i like krishna. the way that you took advantage of that to um, present Krishna consciousness in, in a way that people can relate to as well. So, you know, you might say, okay, well, it's not ideal, but okay, let me take advantage of it in a way that I can mm. talk about it in a way, something that can people can relate to and then help right. them to understand about Krishna consciousness by using those examples. Yeah. Yeah, we have this beautiful philosophy and, and this, this mystical practice, and um, I just wish we were better at marketing, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so on that topic, tell me a bit more, like, what's your goal uh, in terms of your YouTube channel and um, and just in general, like, in terms of your preaching approach and things like that? Well, I don't know what the, the goal is. I mean, I think we're all trying to preach Krishna consciousness and, and practice Krishna consciousness, and we know we're going to die sometime. <laughs> And so I guess we're trying to be as Krishna conscious as we can and try to be, you know, as pure instruments in the, in the hands of, of Lord Chaitanya and, and this is the split succession. Um, so specifically, like, what is the goal of, of my YouTube channel? Well, to reach out to the largest number of people and hopefully touch a few hearts so that they can come forward and, and um, you know, and accept the, the, the process of bhakti yoga as, as Prabhupada taught, you know. Um, <clears throat> And what's the goal of my preaching, like like giving lectures or, or traveling and preaching or passing out books? Re recently, you know, for the last two or two months, I've been actually, you know, maybe spending about a half hour to an hour every day in public and just giving out free books of Prabhupada. Like I, I'm, I'm over asking donations for books, you know, like I respect mm -hmm. monks who are like actual brahmacharis living in a monastery asking donations because i mean that has its precedent all the way in the srimad bhagavatam the seventh canto where the brahmachari's duties are described and one of them is to go out and beg alms you know and then give them to the guru and i think in in western society it's totally understandable that a young monk would ask for a donation and in exchange would give a you know a nice book so um so i, I sort of been there done that in my brahmachari years in los angeles um and I just, again, speaking personally, I just feel a lot more free and, and lightweight uh, approaching people without with knowing that there's there's going to be zero interaction or communication about asking or receiving any money here. And all I'm doing is just introducing myself as a bhakti yoga teacher or as a priest, whatever the context, and just telling them this is a book about what I believe, you know, reincarnation, karma, vegetarianism, uh, God, the soul, um, and giving them a book for free. And I've been doing that for the last two months. And it's kind of brought me back to those years at the LAX airport where you felt a certain uh -huh. certain thrill, you know. Just like today, mm -hmm. I, this morning, I went to chant some rounds and I met this nice girl. I forgot her name, but she was studying theology, actually, this 19-year-old girl. And uh, so she was asking me about my belief in reincarnation. And she was asking me, well, do you, you, know, do you, do you, do you like anything about the Bible? And so I... You know, I was like, well, yeah, I, I admit I've never read the Bible, even though, you know, I have a master's in theology. I've never read the Bible. So actually, I downloaded the audible version of this sort of a theatrical, full-fledged version of the whole Bible. It's like 90 hours. I just bought it after our meeting with this girl. Because I thought, you know, I can't. Right. I got to read the Bible at least once in my life, for God's sakes. But, um, but it, yeah, it was such a nice, you know, exchange. She gave me a picture of Jesus. And then, you know, I gave her this... Uh, I think this conversation, I don't know how you call it in, in uh, perfect witness. It wasn't perfect question, perfect answers. It was like uh, life comes from life. You know, those conversations we right. talk about, yeah. about yeah. modern science. And so um, why am I saying this? Um, I don't know how I got to the topic of book distribution. But yeah, regardless of whatever we're, 
I'm, whatever kind of preaching I'm trying to do, I guess the, the point is to reach out and to help other conditioned souls like us come a little closer to Krishna before we, we have to tap out of this material mm. world, you know. Mm. You know our God sisters, I mean, since we're, it's funny because we're God brothers, right, from the same Diksha Guru. There's this huh? devotee in France called Lila Maduri. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. So she was one of the first devotees I ever met. And I always remember, like, on the phone, she once told me, like, she said, Cyril, there's nothing more glorious in life than to, than to spend your life, um, you know, than, than, than to, go, to, to spend your life going back to the spiritual world. And in your wake, in your wake, you know, bringing as many other people with you as you can. Nice. And that, that analogy always stuck with me, you know. So I think that's, that's what we're doing, regardless of whether, you know, you're married or not married, or whether you're rich or poor or, or have, have this job or this career or that career um, or this nature or that nature, um, you know, just practice Krishna consciousness and according to your means, try to help others come to Krishna as well, you know. I think there's, right, that, that's the... Yeah, yeah, totally. It's important that we practice it ourselves. Like, you know, they say that there's um, something like, it's a great thing to save others, but even greater than that is to save yourself. Something yeah. like that. You know? But interestingly enough, but, Indra Jumna Swami once told me, preaching saves us. Yeah. Like, I know for a fact, like, if you, you know, make it a point to go out and distribute some books or you know that you're going you're gonna to be giving a lecture, you know, in a few hours or after tomorrow that those engagements force you actually to to be a good boy or a good girl you know <laughs> yeah so in a way it's Absolutely. like preaching actually saves us too yeah it's a virtuous cycle you know it's, it's like okay i'm gonna cycle. go whoa i'm gonna preach i've got to give a class or distribute books well okay i better really chant my rounds for the attention exactly. I must depend on krishna i better read the books you know and then when you do that you become a more potent preacher and and then you, you go out and then you know again it inspires you to um, preach more and read more and you know like yeah it's pretty far out yeah so it's part of it's not only helping others but it's helping ourselves it's such an important point okay. I just wanted to touch on a few things like when you were saying about how you're giving out the free books now it sounds like you're the idea was that you want to approach people in a mood of um, giving without you know like um, not wanting anything from the other person, but f but fully just trying to serve. You know, that's kind yeah. of the mood behind it, right? Yeah. Um, I think there's a danger also uh, on the other side of it, though, that when you give out free books, sometimes people don't appreciate them. What are your thoughts on that? Okay, I think that's sort of a, a rather rampant, you know, thought in this gone. Um, because there's a few quotes from Prabhupada, you know, unless they give a donation, right, they won't appreciate the book, right? Mm -hmm. there, there is like that one or two statements by Prabhupada. But we tend to forget that Prabhupada himself, you know, sent out free copies of his books to different American institutions before he got on board of the Jaladuta. There's this picture of him giving one of his Bhagavatams to the prime minister, Bal Ladur or whatever his name was, you know, in, in 1964 or 63 before Prabhupada goes to America. He obviously didn't get asking for a donation. Prabhupada instituted this whole Radha Damodar traveling Sankirtan party of, you know, devotees going across the United States to different colleges and universities and getting the universities to buy sets of Bhagavatam so that students can, you know, check them out for free. And then, you know, whenever book distributors get together and they talk about their experiences, you always hear these stories about how, you know, this guy was, whatever, you know, going back home from a party and then he was half drunk and then he stumbled across something on the floor in the street and it happened to be a Bhagavad Gita and he read it mm. and he became a devotee or, you know, this devotee went to his grandmother's house in, you know, in the Swiss Alps and on the bookshelf <laughs> was like a 1973 edition of the Krishna book, you know, and he read it and he became a devotee, Right. Yeah, so yeah. all these cases are cases where devotees came into contact with Prabhupada's books and didn't give a single cent for them. Now, I remember Brigupati Prabhu. I don't know if you remember Brigupati Prabhu, that Prabhupada disciple who lives in Oh, LA. yeah, of course. He was in New Zealand for many years. Um, and he has experiences of, you know, back in the 70s, devotees going out on big parking lots in New Zealand and putting free books of Prabhupada on the windshield wipers, you know, of every car, only mm -hmm. to, like have rain pour down on them 
or you know come back a few hours later and then see half of them strewn on the street because people yeah. didn't want to yeah. put them inside their car. But I think there's a big, big difference between that type of book distribution and what you know devotees like. Well, what I do, for example, is you know it's really one on one, and you really approach the person, you really ask yeah. them if they're interested, yeah. and you really and once they when they they show genuine interest in the book, um, you know, giving giving it to them is. It's part, it's, of, it's the it's part yeah, of the Rasa. Part of the relationship. Fine. Yeah. yeah. There's quotes by Prabhupada say, who says, you know, as long as the BBT is paid for, you can do whatever you want with the books. Like, yeah. you know, ISKCON is going through the sort of growing pain from a sort of a brahmachari institution, which it basically was in the 1970s, to a congregation based institution, which it is, which is now. And in some areas, we're still kind of operating in a monastic paradigm one of them is the dress code i would say we're still dressing as if we're all like monks and nuns in many ways and another way i would say is this this idea that oh no we have to get donations for the books we distribute otherwise you know they won't appreciate it or otherwise we won't be able to pay the rent because remember like in the early days there was no congregation so the only way devotees could literally like survive was to make money from the books they sold so they could like buy their food and pay rent at the end of the month but now when, you know, ISKCON is, is a congregation-based uh, institution, much like, you know, different Christian groups or like the Mormons or so on, um, we can totally afford to, you know, sponsor free book distribution, as we're already seeing efforts with, for example, the Shastra Dan program or, mm. or um, Motel you know, Gita. the, the yeah. Motel Gita. But those are like programs for people who are like, who either don't have money or why does it have to be like exceptional cases? I was speaking about this to Navina Nirda just recently, like, why not, you know, start a culture in ISKCON of distributing free books to people who could afford them, but to whom we still want to give them out for free because, A, it's a lot easier for us psychologically because, let's face it, approaching a total stranger, even to give him or her something free, it takes, a, it takes a certain amount of humility and courage, you know? And so, Which if, is not a bad thing, perhaps, in some ways. <laughs> which is not a bad thing, but if you push it to the limit, and every time you have to ask for a donation, which is a very sort of humbling, almost humiliating experience, mm. uh, then it can be, it can become a cause of burnout. And and we see a lot of you know devotees who distribute books do it for a few years when they're brahmacharis or brahmacharinis, and then that's it; it's game over for the rest of their life once mm. they get married mm. or once they move on. So I've in my personal life, I've seen that it's just it's it's a sustainable thing for me to distribute books for free because it's actually pleasurable and it's it's very limited on the humiliation part because the worst thing is people say no and as a matter of fact 95 percent of the people actually say yes <laughs> really like in, in in my experience mm -hmm. so the rate of people saying yes is way 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 higher when you're giving them out for free um and it's just much more pleasurable and therefore that's something you want to do again you know next week and next month right, and next right. year and next decade you know so in terms of a lifelong sustainable thing it just it's just easier for 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 the person and b i forgot what i was saying so i, I, don't, I don't know what i'd be justifying right now yeah I'll no I, I understand your point there that it, it's um takes away one of those barriers that might be in the way of someone distributing books like you know it's better that someone goes out and they can just give away the books without the pressure of getting the donation Absolutely. as opposed to thinking that, oh, well, maybe I won't kind of thing. And what, um, a lot uh, of what goes on in, in book distribution seminars is, you know, sales techniques. Mm, mm. You know, okay, you say this and you, you, you say that. And um, take out the, the donation element and then what you have left is just one soul giving a book to another soul. Mm. Period. Very simple. You know, no need of teaching this technique or that technique. You know what I mean? Because yeah, it's yeah. A, a very personal uh, affair. Yeah, I mean, there's a world of difference between what you're talking about and what used to happen, especially in Australasia. Well, basically, what's happening in those days is that devotees would go out and sell Hong Kong paintings or T-shirts or something. That was their full-time living, even if they're monks or whatever. And they would make so much money. Like, literally, the movement had money like anything and then they would basically just give out books just to people like flyers you know right and as or you know as you say even they put them under the wipers of the cars and, and so many books ended up in the rubbish bins and it was really wasteful and, and speaking of rubbish bins you know even when people do give a donation they still end up in the rubbish bin speaking of the la airport i remember remember pedro did you ever meet him pedro the janitor 
Not sure. <laughs> you never had I don't think so. Don't think so. You never had the honor of meeting Pedro the, the no, janitor? No, no I didn't. <laughs> Pedro the janitor, fifty percent of your life is spoil. <laughs> Pedro the janitor was this was this gentleman from Honduras or Guatemala or Mexico, I forgot. I think El Salvador, who worked as, you know, one of the janitors at, at US Airways, Terminal One, you know? And every afternoon, religiously, just about ten minutes before we got our ride back to to New Duarca, he would come with a pile of anywhere from like two to 15 signs of self-realizations or Bhagavad Wow, readers. hardbound books, right? <laughs> hardbound books that people had given a donation to devotees who were trained, granted, to ask very respectfully for donations, you know, and not yeah. be pushy yeah. at all because, you know, the movement was really hurt very badly in North America with aggressive tactics of book distribution in the, in the 80s and 70s. So we were trained to be very, you know, very, very, very sober and, and detached and respectful. And still, every day, you know, Pedro would make his five or ten bucks by selling those books back to us, which were in the <laughs> dustbins that he, you know, that he cleaned out for like 25 cents a piece, I remember. <laughs> so, you oh, know. And, and what's yeah. really good is, you, I think if I can say this, all preachers, even small preachers, should have their own website should have their right. own website or their own blog and their own you know visiting cards that they yeah. give personally to the people that they meet you know i like that idea that's really great that makes and that's another sense. motivation like i have this oops sorry i have this card that i give out and it's a link to my youtube channels or to my website where i have whatever you know, my youtube channels and, and the lectures i'm trying to you know uh, collect and put up on there and so people can have they can see that this is like a real person who belongs to a live tradition and who is not a, who's not afraid to share, you know, not only the, the, the foundational scriptures of his faith and the writings of, of the founder of the, of the you know, institution that he belongs to, but also his or her own small but personal realizations on the topic, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Prabhupada said that, we should, that all of us need to become guru, and in this age... The way that people can connect with us is online a lot of times. I mean, especially if you distribute books at airports, you know, like people are all over the world. Right. Um, and it's such a great way to keep in touch with people. You know, I mean, social media has its pluses and minuses, but one of the pluses is that you can keep in touch with people that way. Yeah. And preach cool. that way. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, so going on from... Yeah, so we've um, talked about a few different things. I just wanted to talk about your music now. That's another project that you've been developing, and you've had quite some success with it. Um, tell us more about that, how you got into that, and um, you know, how that's going. Well, um, comparing us, Hare Krishnas, to, for example, Christians, our, uh, our numbers are way, 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 way smaller, right? So, in the West, right? We're talking about that particularly. Yeah, in the West. <laughs> oh, yeah, even in the world, actually. <laughs> even in the world. In India, you have this band called the Madhavas. I don't yeah. know if you've ever seen, you've seen them, like this couple. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and they have a pretty, you know, big following there. But in the West, it's, you know, I mean, we can't really, our efforts right now, and, and okay, let's put it this way. You look at the Christian rock industry or the Christian music, you know, the Christian pop music industry. It's, it's an industry that's worth millions and millions of dollars. And even though it's a very specific niche, namely, you know, Christians, most of them are you know, evangelical Christian teenagers, we're still talking about millions and millions of dollars and millions of fans and millions of records sold. Why? Mm. Because, you know, there's 2,000 years of Christendom from which to, you know, to pick out fans from. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas Gaudiya Vaishnavism, my God, has been in the West for 50 years. And so our, our congregation, our, our, you know, Vaishnav community, especially in the West, is, is like microscopic. So I'm saying this because, you know, I, I, following our efforts in Poland with Village of Peace, I, I went ahead and did a sort of a small solo album with the help of this Grammy-winning uh, producer um, who lives in L.A., who was originally from, from Liechtenstein. And uh, it was actually his idea that most of the album be, you know, Maha Mantras with cool. different sort of pop rock, thank you, pop rock, you know, uh, melodies and stuff. And to be fair, like, 
you know, who's going to be interested? Like, I knew from the beginning that this, you know, this would be limited in terms of an, of, of, of an audience because, again, like, who's interested in, in the Maha Mantra and who's interested in an album where there's only the Maha Mantra? You know, you're really reducing the niche to, to, to a small, 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 small slice. Um, mm. So when you talk about success, I don't know how successful it's been. I mean, you know, some devotees like the music, some devotees like the videos, and I performed at this Just Love Festival, this festival that takes place in in Germany every summer in July. Oh, yeah, cool. I mean, every, cool. every summer in the north northern hemisphere. Um, but it was more like an offering to Krishna, like, okay, this is an album for you, and where I'm, you know, really glorifying you with the holy name and again the, the the idea of yukta vairagya of using you know the latest technology or in this case the the latest you know music um, trends or the music the latest music sounds or mm. in krishna service with the you know this this thing that billy graham have you heard of billy graham krishna do yeah he's a christian preacher from way back when yeah he was like one of the biggest evangelicals in, in america in the, in the 50s and 60s he, he coined this term Anchored to the rock, geared to the times. Mm -hmm. and that's a great, great saying, isn't it? And that's what Yukta Vairagya is about, like being anchored to our to our principles, to our practice, to our to our theological conclusion, and yet, um, and yet, preaching with with the latest technology, the latest, you know, like for example, we know that Rupa Goswami. I'm not a Sanskrit scholar, but I know that he wrote in a particular style of Sanskrit that was quite popular in the day. Mm -hmm. So even with language, we see like, you know, Bhakti, Narutam Dasakur, you know, adjusted his preaching and started writing songs in vernacular Bengali. Why? Mm -hmm. So that, you know, people who are used to vernacular Bengali and not Sanskrit or classical Bengali uh, would have access to, to, to the teachings of Krishna. Same thing with Bhakti, Thakur, who wrote, songs in not only in Bengali, but in English, right? And mm. Prabhupada, who, who, who preached in English and, and wrote in English. Why? Because language-wise, English was becoming the, the sort of the, the world language, right? So similarly, yes. you have these trends in terms of music styles, in terms of culinary styles, in terms of, of uh, well, in, in terms of dress styles. And I think it's the duty of the Vaishnavas not to reject those, but to actually embrace those with Krishna in the center mm. for the sake, again, of making Krishna consciousness most accessible, accessible to the largest number of souls, you know, because culturally speaking, most souls are just comfortable in the culture of the country where they live and the culture in which they grew up. Right. Mm. Some exceptions, you know, are like, for example, there's like people who are really into India, Indophiles, we call them. Maybe they were Indians in the past life, or who knows? But they just they, they love they love Indian food, or or some people really love I don't know they're they're they love whatever they love um, you know Korean culture, even though they were born in New Zealand or they were born in, in mm. Austria. But those are very small numbers. So I think the Vaishnava and the Vaishnavi's duty is to to see where he or she is situated culturally, pick out the sattva the sattvic elements of that local culture. That's important because we do want to live in sattva guna and, and, and use that sattva guna as a platform to practice and to preach Krishna consciousness. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because if you look at Krishna core, there was a lot of things about it which are not all that sattvic. But even then, you reach people from where they are and then you bring them from that place. Yeah, you don't necessarily bring them to an Indian culture, though. That's, that's an interesting thing yeah. you bring up. Yeah. Like, for example, you know, I mean, the, the bridge programs, the idea of a bridge program. Well, the idea is, you know, a bridge to what? You know, that's an interesting question. Like, what are we bringing mm. them to? Like, for example, you have some preaching projects. Let's use the dress code issue because that's something I talk a lot about. So some preaching projects have a sort of a come as you are dress code, right? And then, mm. but then some projects are, are, are would have this sort of fine print that's not, you know, explicit but it's 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 in, it's in the fine print of the contract that okay listen we're not going to talk about it but it's understood that after this person has gone through this program for a few weeks or a few months he or she will will ideally graduate to the dodi and the sari for example right, right? yeah and this is where i think some devotees say no that's not necessary they don't have to graduate to a dodi or a sari or for that matter, to you know, samosas and kachoris offered to Krishna, 
they can just <laughs> graduate to deeper Krishna consciousness within their own culture, remaining and dressed in pants and shirts and eating whatever veggie burgers offered to Krishna. But yeah, deepening yeah. their Krishna consciousness to the point of becoming pure devotees within that cultural language. Yeah. Keep the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. <laughs> yeah, which is Krishna, right? I was yeah. giving can I I was giving the example just yesterday about American oh, sorry, American football. I was bringing it back to sports. You know how you guys have rugby in in, in New Zealand, right? Yeah. So that's kind of a stupid question. I think <laughs> I think I've heard of it. I, I think I've heard of it. Some, some, <laughs> some New Zealand like people that play it or something, isn't it? <laughs> so you know in American football you have like the equivalent of a of a touchdown, but you can throw the ball forward and, yep. and you can throw the ball forward. So you can get a touchdown by either like running into the, the end zone or catching the ball in the end zone, right? So some some uh, uh, touchdowns are really ugly in the sense that the ball like falls loose and then there's like these big guys who are not supposed to be, you know, running backs or what to speak of catchers, but who just happen to be near the ball and they just grab it and clumsily push their way into into the end zone and they get their touchdown, right? They get the seven points. Yeah. And then there's these like picture perfect Hollywood moment, you know, Kodak moment touchdowns where there's like one second left in the clock and the quarterback, you know, throws the perfect spiral and then the, the, the wide receiver, you know, jumps in midair and while in midair, you know, smiles and, and, and blinks an eye to the camera and, you know, <laughs> catches the, the ball with, with, with a, a little glisten and, from the teeth, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Glisten on the teeth, catches the ball with one hand, you know, lands with his two feet inside the line before going off, you know, outside, off bounds as the run, as the clock runs out and, you know, scores a touchdown. So, you know, one touchdown is really ugly and clumsy. Another is whatever, more beautiful and more, yeah, more beautiful, let's say. But the point is, it doesn't matter how they got the touchdown. The point is they got the touchdown. They got those seven points. Yeah. So we have to remember, I think, that in Krishna consciousness, the goal is Krishna consciousness. The goal is to become Krishna conscious. That's the ultimate goal. And so if you become Krishna conscious, if you start acting on the platform of chanting the holy name regularly, you know, following the four regulative principles we're supposed to follow, that's, that's perfection right there. And so whether you got there, you know, by X cultural vehicle or Y cultural vehicle, or, you know, by a strict Varnashram system, or just by a total chaotic, you know, post-industrial in, you know, technological kind of system in a big urban setting, like a, like a New York or a Mexico city, it doesn't matter at the end of the day, if you, you know, become Krishna conscious. Mm. And I think sometimes, you know, I tend to forget that, or some of us tend to forget that. And we tend to yeah, think that yeah. the way we get there is more important than the goal, but actually the goal is more important. And, and we believe that the process of Krishna consciousness is so powerful that it really does not depend on any material um, consideration. What do you mm -hmm. think? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Like the basic idea is that the principle of Yukta Vairagya is to use whatever's favorable. And, you know, if um, wearing the dhoti and things like that's favorable, then go ahead and do it. But if it's an impediment, then we should look at other ways to do things, you know, mm. for sure. And, um, and according to the context that we're living in. Um, yeah, I mean, just like with you, were just bringing it back to your music, I was just thinking that you were saying that, you know, the music that I'm making, it's, it's modern, but it's all the Maha Mantra, so it's probably not going to appeal to a broader audience. But what it might do is inspire other devotee musicians to think, oh, I can make music of that style. Mm. And they might make music which, um, you know, is for a broader audience and, you know, get some traction. So, you know, you might yeah. be thinking that, oh, okay, you know, I've done this project and it sounds good and, you know, a few devotees like it, but you never know what it might lead on to, you know. Um, sometimes, yeah, yeah, I think that sometimes um, – you know, the things that we do might have more of an impact than we realize. Mm. Um, I was just thinking, you know, I mean, you've got like Boy George and he made his Maha Mantra track, which became popular. And then you also had that um, devotee Pia in the UK. She made that song Sham. Yeah, Sham. And that was really popular, you know. It, it went Sham. to the top of the New Age Havi, charts or something. Yeah. Havi, mm. Havi Prabhu, you know, Symphony of the Soul. If anyone mm. who's listening hasn't heard that album, you really should listen to it. It's called Symphony of the Soul. Yeah. Javi or Elon Chester. 
right Probably. yeah i should check it out yeah uh, the he name's familiar but i've never really got into it he recorded it with the philharmonic orchestra of, of caracas so you've got a whole philharmonic orchestra Fair and the only devotee yeah, who ever did that was that. Bhagavan back in, in the like the 70, late 70s or early 80s with the oh, I used to love orchestra. that album. We used to listen to that album all the time at Gopal's when I first um, mm. sort of started coming to the, the temple. It, it, that was amazing. Mm. Elon Chester, right? Yeah. And Javi. That's awesome. Yeah, and but even with your song, I think, um, not sure how it happened. Maybe you can give us a little bit of inside knowledge here, but... Apparently, one of the songs that you produced was put on um, a playlist on, you know, like a mainstream radio station or something like that. Well, not really. It's like an internal playlist of a okay. producer I worked <laughs> with. So I yeah. wish I hadn't mentioned that because that's more of an embarrassment than, than a success <laughs> story. But, you know, he must have some people that are listening to it that are not devoted yeah. to getting that exposure, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. It's easy to, uh, what do you call it, um, underplay what we do, but often, um, you know, it can have more of a, an effect than you realize. Yeah, um, I guess we want to, we want to, you know, we want to touch the entire world. And then when we don't, we think we're like a total failure. But, you know, that analogy of the, um, again, a Christian preaching analogy of the, of the sea, uh, this, how do you call them? Etoile de mer. In French, you say etoile de mer. They're starfish. Kind of like starfish. 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 Yeah, starfish. Yeah. So you know the analogy of the starfish and the guy walking on the beach with all these starfish mm. on the mm. sand? Yeah. So there's all these starfish on the sand at low tide, and they're stuck there dying, basically. And so this guy just walks there and, and, and picks up, like, five or six and throws them back into the ocean. But there's, like, you know, 10,000 starfish stranded on low, at low tide on the, on the sand. And so one may mm. say, well, what's the use of throwing back five or 10 or 20 back into the water? There's, like, 10,000 of them. But the point is, from the point of view of those five or six or 10 or 20 starfish that have been thrown back into the ocean, they're loving it. They're just, they're so grateful to have been brought back to life, literally, you know? Mm, and, yeah, totally. And to them, right? It doesn't matter if there's like 10,000 other starfish that are stranded. For that one starfish that was thrown back into the water, you know, you've, you've changed the world for that starfish. Absolutely, so, yeah. I'm yeah, listening to great, myself great here. Analogy. Yeah. Isn't it? Like sometimes yeah, absolutely. Think, oh, there's not enough people coming to Krishna consciousness, and it is a tough time to to live and preach Krishna consciousness, Krishna and do like. Yeah. I mean, we should. I think we should be grateful about you know whatever moment was the time when Lord Chaitanya allowed us to to come to His Lotus Feet. Is you know we should like we can't say well I don't like this particular time like <laughs> you know let me join like in 200 years. But I think from an objective point of view, like coming to Krishna consciousness now is probably one of the hardest times to come to Krishna consciousness and to preach and to live Krishna consciousness ever because mm -hmm. it's just after Prabhupada's passing away. So we miss those years of, you know, seeing Prabhupada face to face. And Okay. We know he's in his books. He's in his lectures. We've heard the rhetoric and it's, we believe it's true, but still at the same time, there is something to be said about having been there during the, you know, the manifest physical presence of Prabhupada on earth. Right. Yeah, for sure. So we never got to see that. And so we joined at a time when, you know, there were mistakes that had been made. And so we're kind of like, in, in some ways, carrying the burden of certain mistakes that were done or immature, you know, behavior, which is totally, uh, you know, to be expected from any, any new religious institution. Um, and so it's kind of hard. So, and Krishna consciousness hasn't been established as a, you know, mainstream tradition yet, you know, really large scale. So it's like we, we miss Prabhupada's, you know, like uh, tsunami kind of 10-year <laughs> decade. And then yeah. we are also way before, you know, the time when Krishna consciousness becomes really like stable and, and established and has like 200 years of a track record. So it's, it's a hard time to – I asked yeah, Redina, I told this to Redina Maharaj once. Right? <laughs> growing pain. You know what he said? It was cool. cool. I, I told Redina Maharaj this exact same thing. And he said, well, it's just like in Charles Dickens – uh, a tale of two cities and it starts out with uh, the sentence it was the best it was the worst of times <laughs> it was the best of times <laughs> yeah totally interesting yeah and just going on that starfish analogy it just spiked a thought in my mind that you know a train of thought i've been having lately is that 
you know, sometimes we can get caught up in external things and thinking, oh, what are the numbers? How many books are distributed? How many right. plates are going out? How many this and that? But, you know, there's a few occasions when Prabhupada said that we have enough devotees. Just boil the milk, you know, work right. with the devotees that we have. And, you know, even Stephen Covey, he had a, a saying, I forget where he got it from, but he said that it takes more nobility of character to fully give yourself to one person than to save the whole world or something like that. Hmm. Interesting. Meaning to say that, you know, if we can really just um, deeply influence and help just a few people, it can have a massive impact. You mm. know? Um, and it takes a lot more personalism as well. You know? True. Uh, which, yeah, it's quite an interesting point um, related to that. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to move on also because just probably to kind of wrap things up because I respect your time with me here a while. You recently, um, you know, did some preaching in France. You know, you set up as a centre, and that's always a challenging thing to do. Interest, interested to hear about what your experience was and what kind of um, advice you'd give to someone who is thinking of taking up some kind of project. And, um, you know, because I, I th- I'm hearing from you before, you felt like you had mixed success. You know, there was some success, but maybe not as much as you hoped for. Um, what did you know? So, what was your experience, and what advice would you have for someone who's thinking of doing something like that? Well, um, I went with a devotee called Rasa Mandala, who's from Morocco, um, and who's been in his con for like thirty years. He's, he's in, I think, early sixties. He lives in Vrindavan. as a sort of a, a retired Vanaprastha. He writes books on Islam and Krishna consciousness. Oh, yeah, cool. So he 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 speaks you know quasi fluent French and and he was available and so I and I had had an experience of going to Nantes, which is a city uh, which was voted actually as the the number one green city in Europe for the last several years in in northern mm-hmm. western France, and I remember a year ago actually I went there on my own, thinking okay I'll just rent a place and I'll just basically do what Prabhupada did in New York in 1966. <laughs> And I learned very quickly, you know, within a month that I just, I wasn't proud <laughs> and, uh, and just the, the three modes of nature were just overwhelming me. And, uh, and I was you know, just kind of, kind of getting depressed and I just couldn't handle the, you know, the cooking, the clean. Fortunately, I had some money aside, so I didn't have to work, but still just maintaining, you know, a decent amount of sadhana and then, and then preaching and cooking and cleaning and then, you know, trying to bring people to, to, to your home to do programs all alone was just too difficult. I just mm-hmm. I ran out of steam. And as a matter of fact, you know what's interesting? You know, like we hear from Prabhupada himself in 1966 when he was in New York, there was a moment where he would actually go to the, the either the, you know, wherever the boat, the harbor the is. Ship, or the shipping company or something. Right, mm-hmm. the shipping company to see when was the next boat going back to India. <laughs> and he would go there regularly. <laughs> and this is Prabhupada. Amazing, right? And so we understand. Eh? Amazing. It's amazing. Like you could put yourself into his mind. He was like, okay, I'm fed up. This is too much. I'm out of here. I, I got to go back to Vrindavan. Yeah, I, I gave it would, a try. It didn't work. I gave uh, it a try. It didn't work. Yeah. I'm tired. And then, well, you know what? My guru asked me to do this. So let me let me just stick it out for another week. You know. And then a week later, okay, this is it. This is it. I'm going back. And then, okay, when's the next boat out? Oh, uh, you know what? Let's just give it one more try, right? And that's, I mean, I, the only way I can understand this is was like a, that it's it's a pastime to show us who are actually conditioned souls how difficult mm-hmm. it can be. Um, so speaking for myself, and, and if, since you asked for an advice, like if you don't do this alone, uh, mm-hmm. if if you're married, that's you know very good. You can do it as, as as a couple, and even then it's difficult. You know, even then you need to sometimes take a break and go to a community and recharge with like a full morning program with other devotees and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, or go with a group of, of, you know, other devotees who have some free time. And, and then what we're, so we, we rented an apartment in a place called Montpellier, which is a student a college town near Marseille in the South of France, where the winter is, is, is not so harsh. It's the second sunniest city in France where it's very sunny. There's about 400,000 people. And out of those 400,000, I think like 100,000 are students. It's a very young, oh, perfect, vibrant perfect. city. And so what we did is we, you know, we would tune into Radhadesh's online morning program in the morning and do a morning program like that. Um, and then we'd spend some time going to the, to the university 
you know, neighborhood and, and pass out free books and, and cards to our little program that we're having at our home where we'd invite people. And, but actually, it turned out that not many people came forward just from the card. People who came were actually people we actually, like you talked about, like had personal, like people who actually showed interest and whose numbers we took and then who, who mm-hmm. we called and invited for an informal dinner, you know? Nice. And, yeah. And so they would show up and we'd cook the a pers- nice dinner. The personal touch, right? Like the personal touch. Getting to but, know but people all, and sort of exactly. the relationship. But all along being very straightforward about our identity and what we're preaching. You know, I mean, I'm all for mm-hmm. indirect bridge preaching. That's totally cool. You know, if you want to teach through yoga and through Ayurvedic cooking, through this seminar, that seminar, that's perfectly fine. I think, you know, all sorts of preaching can and should go on. I personally resonate with, uh, with you know, direct preaching in the sense of speaking directly from our scriptures, directly from the Bhagavad Gita, directly the Maha Mantra from day one with the, the, the difference being that, you know, you do it in Western clothes from day one to today, <laughs> infinity. So, so the, 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 again, the language is neutral, the clothes are neutral, the food is neutral, and yet the message is like direct Krishna consciousness. And, and this is what, yeah. well, again, this is what evangelical Christians do, you know. I really yeah, am inspired anchored, by the way anchored they... Anchored to the rock and geared to the anchored times. Anchored to the rock, geared to the times, exactly. So, mm-hmm. you know, we spent about two months there and we gave it a try and we saw, we concluded that, yeah, indeed, there's a, there's a lot of potential. And who knows if, if Krishna arranges for me to, you know, to, to go there again with, with an, another team or another situation, uh, I would consider, you know, setting camp there. Or, or, yeah, setting up camp there, maybe in Marseille, which is a, a, a right cl- next door and much bigger, actually, than Montpellier. Mm-hmm. But uh, so if any advice, well, go for it. I don't know. <laughs> and be Krishna <laughs> conscious, make sure you have good association. And, yeah. 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 So it seems like a, the big point that you're making there is that it's very hard to do it on your own. But if you can get a team, even if it's, you know, a smallish team, but um, it really helps to have that association to help you do it. At least for me. Uh, Kshudi Prabhu, Prabhupada disciple from Laguna Beach, he was 16 years old when he went to South Africa all alone. Wow. You know, and preach there all alone. I guess so I, it depends on the individuals. You know, at least speaking for myself, I, I can't do something like this alone. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, well, it's great um, catching up with you, Prabhu, and um, it's been really inspiring Sorry to hear I did about all the, the speaking. <laughs> oh no, I mean that's what I'm here for. I'm here to hear from you, not from not I for me to do I think it's great how you're facilitating <laughs> this. Yeah, thanks, Prabhu. Thank yeah, you. do you have any other um, thoughts just wrapping up? You know, I, I mean, just for my summary, I would um, say that, you know, in our talk today, it's been very inspiring because we've heard about the different initiatives that you've taken and hopefully it will inspire other devotees to take initiative as well, whether it's starting a YouTube channel and, you know, talking about, you know, current affairs or um, topical issues and connecting it with Christian consciousness or if it's, um, you know, doing the singing the Maha Mantra to modern music. Uh, or if it's going out there and and with on your own or with a small group of people setting up a preaching center to try to reach the you know the, reach more people and bring them to Christian consciousness, you know I think all these things that you've done are really inspiring and it's great to be able to share about it so that others can hear and um, maybe do the same same thing. Um, so yeah, do you have any final words that you might want to share? Um, you know, particularly Thank about you. anyone who. It might be thinking about of what? taking initiative or something like that. It's got some idea of, you know, taking initiative to do something or, you know. Well, I think if anything there's anything like that. that we've inherited as, as the, I guess, a second generation after Prabhupada, it's that, that burning desire, I guess, even at a small level, like at least like, like me, uh, but this desire nonetheless to, um, to spread Krishna consciousness. In, in a rational, intelligent, you know, non-sectarian, non-fanatical, non-dogmatic, but pure, beautiful way. You know, I think we've inherited that. If there's anything that's, that's transpired from the generation of Prabhupada to, to us, right, it's this, um, this, this theme of, of self-sacrifice for the sake of, uh, of expanding the Sankirtan movement. Mm-hmm. And um, and I think that's that's really important. That's what we kind of um, that that's you know as as Lord Chaitanya says, vidya vadu jivanam. It really is the the life of, of of our spiritual life. You know the right the engine. 
Yeah, like going back to that quote from Indra Dhamnaraj that you said that it's the preaching that saves us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Nice. So it's nice to stay in the fire, both for awesome. ourselves and for the sake of others. Yeah, well, that's wonderful, Prabhu. Well, thanks a lot for um. Thank you for giving, your time. Giving your, to all the listeners. Your time. Yeah, and uh, now you were mentioning about websites before, so yeah, can you let us know how if people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to keep in touch? You've got your YouTube channel. Okay. Do you have a website as well? Yeah. So the YouTube channel is called Easy Bhakti. So that's the channel's name on YouTube. Um, if you speak French, I have a French one called L'âme Libre, which means the, the free soul. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and both links, including you know my lectures that I'm starting to you know collect on on a podcast platform, um, are on my website, which is just called EasyBhakti.com. Okay. Cool. And um, yeah, the links to the music are also there, and, and um, so yeah, you're welcome to come. It's always a tricky thing because you don't want to put yourself forward too much, but okay. at the same time, you kind of have to for the sake of you know the, the message that you're that you're trying to represent. And so I think the secret is to pray to Krishna to free from the desire to get name and fame and adoration, but at the same time not stop putting yourself forward. Just pray that you know Krishna can eliminate the 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 selfish motivation in doing that. And then what's left is really just a desire to, to put Krishna forward. You know what I mean? Right. That's nice. Yeah. 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 Perfect. We've been given the order by Lord Chaitanya that we all have to become guru, but we're like, we think to ourselves, well, who am I to become a guru? I might get puffed up and proud, but we have to um, follow the order of Lord Chaitanya. We all have to become guru in some way or other. Um, and then we have to do the work of um, keeping our purity as well. Right. <laughs> Developing well it. Yeah, so oh, that's really great, Prabhu. Thanks a lot for the interview and um, look Thank forward to catching much. up and hearing about your yeah, um, next see you soon adventures. Physically. Yeah, very well. Thanks for listening. To find out more, go to SuccessfulVaishnavas.com Whatever little service that anyone can do for Krishna is to be appreciated and celebrated. Just give this life to Krishna. We know that they have much more potential than they are presently using. I went to a place of relishing the activity and letting go of the result completely. You just associate with pure devotees. Then you shall be able to cross over the ocean of Nisayans.